this is about how to use threatened species information and threatened species data. And uh, essentially we're using the system of economic and environmental accounting frameworks that come from the United Nations. And this work has really been led by Michael Varden, who used to be at the ABS, but has also had a lot of time working at the World Bank. And Heather Keith, who's our carbon expert in the Finner School, but has also now started to move into the accounts process. So in, in many ways, this is not rock, rocket science. This has been developed by the United Nations in, uh, this document comes from 2012. And over 30 countries worldwide use this accounting framework. And the ACT is about to start on this environmental accounting framework as well. So essentially it's a process where you look at ecosystem assets, think about them in terms of ecosystem services, human inputs to uh, various ecosystems, and then look at it in terms of benefits and beneficiaries. And so essentially what we're trying to do is start to speak the language of economics and accountancy through uh, environmental assets. And you can turn it into a horrendogram with lots of different uh, things going in different directions, but it's a similar kind of thing, ecosystem services, assets, <coughs> looking at goods and services and benefits. And essentially what you're starting to do is to try to think of what we call IVA, uh, that's industry value added value. So that's the contribution of these various ecosystem assets to GDP and uh, the economic system. And as you'll see, it becomes uh, quite an interesting process and not always uh, friendly for certain kinds of uh, organisations. We run large scale long term projects and the reason I put this in is that we do have an opportunity to start to look at agricultural uh, environmental and ecosystem um, accounting in the years to come. But we're looking at, in this case, our longest term study, 34 years from the central highlands of Victoria. And these are uh, quite magnificent forests. There's a picture of yours truly in a long term site 470 in the middle of the O'Shaughnessy water catchment. And essentially what we've done from those long term sites is pull together data on carbon values. So these are not modelled, this is actual true measurements of carbon. We have uh, data on biodiversity from those long term sites. We also have data from uh, our long term sites on timber values. And then we've taken information from Melbourne Water on their water values and also from Vic Forests on their timber values and tourism, eco, uh, tourism satellite accounts and also the ABS. So this provides a framework to start to parachute in these data sets to begin to understand the value of these different ecosystem services and ecosystem assets. And we've produced a, an ecosystem account from that. This is the short version of it. And I've got about a dozen copies here. I'd really rather not take them with me because uh, I've got to cycle home with them. And I'd rather if other people took them off my hands. This is about 15 pages of summary document. There's about 200 pages of, of this document with all the tables and figures and all the other information in it. Um, if you wanted to follow that up, and I'm more than happy to send that to you um, via email. So when you start to populate the account, what you need to do is to understand the asset base that you're looking at. And this is quite an instructive process. It takes a lot of work to define the area that you want to work with. So ours was the Central Highlands of Victoria as an area. You could do the ACT or you can do down to the scale of individual farms. And so we need to look at the different kinds of land cover and the land use in these particular areas, be they dams or forests or agricultural areas. And then you need to start to look at the condition of the different assets. Now this becomes a very instructive process because to do this we actually needed to understand what was happening on every hectare of forest in this particular jurisdiction. When it was logged, when it was burnt, how old it is, what its history. And as I'll get to at the end of this story, it's quite instructive as to what happens when you do this, quite sobering. So we have the age class in terms of uh, a measurement of the condition, quote unquote, in this uh, in this system. And we can look at the proportion of the forest in different areas. You can see that this forest is dominated by forest that's relatively young, dates before 1939. And you can start to get, a, again, an idea of, of how the asset's going. And so using Melbourne Waters data, we can look at uh, a water account. 
and look at how much water is stored in, the, in reservoirs and how much water is used as part of this stocks and flows component of, of this accounting process. We can also look at uh, this very important relationship between the age of the forest and water yield. So what we see in these forests is that the older the forest gets, the more <coughs> water is produced. It's basically, when you have a young forest, it's like having a household full of teenagers that clean out your fridge. So essentially as the forest is growing quickly, it's transpiring a lot of water, not much water makes it into stream flow. So the amount of water running into reservoirs is significantly impaired. And so you can actually look at it, for example, in relation to the largest reservoir in the system, the Thompson Reservoir, which takes about four years to fill. And that is an open catchment. Much of the, the wet forest is logged in that, that area. And you can look at uh, your account in terms of the reduction of inflow to the reservoir and how much of the ecosystem service value is removed through that process. We can look at it in terms of carbon accounts and to some extent this is a little bit mythical because we don't have the carbon methodology yet and I'll get to that end of the story but we can look at the carbon sequestration potential, we can look at how much um, carbon you can add to this system, these are some of the most carbon dense forests in the world and you can look at that in terms of a nominal price under the emissions reduction fund if, uh, if, you, if the methodology was ever developed and look at it in terms of what it might be uh, in terms of its value to the, to the um, Victorian economy. We can look at timber accounts and one of the interesting things here is that uh, essentially your wood volume production has largely been even across the period 1991 through to 2014. Very important result even though about 50,000 hectares of ash forest was burnt in, in about three or four hours in 2009, the, the wood volume flow hasn't actually changed in that time. Big implications for what the forest looks like. So uh, we can look at how much of the forest is harvested. Now comes really part of the tricky part of this process that uh, Michael and Heather and others in our group really struggle with, how to develop a biodiversity account. And so this is very simple. Uh, way of, one simple way of looking at this is to, is to look at uh, what's changing in terms of the time period between 2000 and 2015 in terms of the net change in numbers of regional, regionally extinct species, been no change, we've lost two species but no more. The number of critically endangered species has actually increased quite markedly from zero to five, endangered, vulnerable and otherwise. So you get a sense of what's happening in terms of overall numbers of species. But you can do it for particular groups and, and one of the groups we've worked on for a long time, possums and gliders, you can see the response curves over the, the last 10 years in terms of the abundance of animals per site across these different kinds of sites, be they old growth forests where there's a steep decline, uh, 1939 regrowth forest, uh, mixed age forest, there's a decline basically across all of those kinds of, of uh, forest types. Okay, so now we're starting to get to, the, to part of the pointy end of this and we can look at the value of the different ecosystem services under this accounting process. And we can look at the, for example, the water provision, it's in blue, as water things probably should be. Uh, but we can look at other things in terms of the value of that ecosystem service in terms of uh, millions of dollars. And we can see, for example, water is, is highly significant in terms of its contributions here. Some of the contributions of some of the sectors are actually not particularly substantial. So there's the timber provision service down here. Um, so this starts to give you the, an idea of the relativities of the different sectors uh, in this particular area. Okay, now we start to get to um, the contribution of these different ecosystem assets to the economy. So this is uh, industry value added, that's the uh, acronym IVA. So it's revenue less costs and wages. Basically it's the contribution of a given industry to GDP. And we can see in this system in the Central Highlands that agriculture is a, is a very important contributor. And the reason for that is that this, this area produces water which is used in the wine industry to produce high quality wine through the Yarra Valley. But it's also very important for horticulture and other crops in this, in this system. We can see other industries like tourism in this area are also significant contributors in terms of their industry value added value to, to the state's GDP. We can also see um, 
other sectors basically haven't changed significantly in that time and the relativities of these particular um, industries relative to others are pretty markedly, pretty marked. You can see this from this approach. Now these numbers come from, as I said, the satellite tourism accounts for Victoria, the annual reports from Vic Forest, from Melbourne Water and the like. So we haven't massaged these, these come direct from, from annual reports and elsewhere. So now you can start to break those type, kinds of graphs down into numbers. So for example, you can look at the industry value added total for particular industries, agriculture, water, tourism and native forest harvesting. Or you can break those values up into a per hectare per year basis depending on the size of the, the estate from which you're drawing your asset. And so we see an industry value added here for agriculture, for water supply, for tourism and for native forest harvesting. So there are a lot of complaints about this approach even though it's a standardised methodology. Some people felt that we had uh, downplayed the downstreaming part of the various industries. So even if you were to assume that there was uh, no costs of cutting forests and you were to double the value, for example, you would still see the relativities in terms of where you're at with these numbers. Very important outcome. So some very important summary uh, notes. So there's a change over time in the ecosystem extent and condition. Most of the biggest changes in terms of extent are taking place with clearing for agriculture, uh, establishment of plantations on former cleared land and urban development. The condition change in the system is mostly due to a reduction in forest age and that's associated both with fire and logging and the combination of both, or salvage logging. We can look at the value of the ecosystem services by the different industries. So uh, water values and agricultural values are very high and the benefits of those industries, agricultural, water and tourism are large relative to those from the timber, uh, native forest timber industry. The trade-offs become very important in this case. So the activities of water supply, carbon sequestration and tourism are largely mutually inclusive in the sense that uh, when you work with wanting to increase the amount of carbon stored in the system, uh, increase the amount of water that's produced from the system for agriculture or human consumption, those benefits are basically in mutually inclusive and they can uh, essentially um, do relatively well in combination with biodiversity conservation. We know that harvesting of forests reduces the biodiversity value of those forests, that's well documented. We know that it reduces the, the water flows of those forests, that's been well documented and it changes the age class structure quite markedly in the system. So the final slide is that um, there is potential to contribute to the Victorian economy through the service of carbon sequestration, it's just that the methodology to allow that to happen hasn't been developed or hasn't been implemented or both. And clearly, from the perspective of this particular meeting, the condition of biodiversity is declining. We're seeing significant temporal declines in virtually every single species of, of uh, arboreal marsupial that we're looking at. We're seeing an increase in the number of species <coughs> added to more severe conservation status groupings in this system. So um, that's really my little ditty. I think I've gone in under time. Um, I'm not sure if there's time for questions, but essentially that's the, the first stage of this ecosystem accounting approach. Um, Michael and Heather have been to Victoria to talk to them about this process and involved people such as Mark Eigenram, uh, who've been involved in, in environmental accounting through the Victorian Government. And I know that there were people from the Australian Government and various agencies involved in that. So that's the story so far. Okay,